On behalf of the pastor-elect Joshua M. Daniels, his family, and the Congregation of the Olive, we welcome all visitors and friends here. We invite you to be fully engaged in this worship experience wherever you are by joining us in praise, worship, and the Word. Is that church is a little too long. And I think if that's the only complaint, we're kind of doing all right. Hallelujah. So let's see if I can get y'all out of here. Let's see. Luke chapter 22. <laughs> <laughs> Let's check our reading today at verse 39. Concluding and climaxing our reading at verse number 44. I'm reading today from the New International Version of the Word of God. It may read slightly different from yours, but if your book says Bible, you're in good company. This is how my Bible reads. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. His disciples followed him. And reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. The sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Verse 42, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will. King Jimmy says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Say amen for the reading. Amen. If you don't mind for the time that is also shared together today before you take your seats, I want to tag this text with this thought in our minds, coping with your cup. Well, you find the neighbor to the left to the right. If you don't like him, should have said bamboo's too late now and tell him, neighbor, you got to cope with your cup. Lift those hands towards heaven and say, Lord, speak. We need to hear. You may be seated in the presence of our good and gracious God. Ushers, you can take your seats. Thank you for serving so dutifully. Coping with your cup. Coping with your cup. Allow me to start out by saying that the U.S. Navy SEALs are known for saying, get comfortable being uncomfortable. That statement will not resonate with most of us because we live in a world that craves comfort and despises discomfort. Wayne Meeking, in his book, When All Else Fails, says it this way says that our increasing need for comfort and quick fixes inhibits us from imagining anything that will call us forth into new ways of thinking and being. It says we therefore adapt to our resistance, continue to recycle old ways of thinking, being that prevent us from change, and in short, we stay stuck. In other words, what Min King is really saying is that most people are unable to move into their destiny because they don't know how to manage discomfort. And one of the reasons for this, because somewhere along the way, we bought into the notion, we bought into the false notion, rather, that anything of God should feel good or be good all the time. We believe that whatever is of God ought to feel good to us. Friends, it's discomfort that leads to growth. It's discomfort that leads to new ways of thinking. It's discomfort that leads to evolution. It's discomfort that leads to innovation. It's discomfort that leads to maturity. And ultimately, friends, it's discomfort that leads us to destiny. Because here is a little proposition for my little sermon today, and hold on to it. You will never achieve destiny without learning how to accept discomfort. That's the lesson we find leaping from the pages of this passage in Luke today. Because today in our text, we find Jesus in an interesting spot. He's in between communion and capture. Between supper and being seized just finished administering the first Lord's Supper to his disciples in the upper room. Now he is in the process of being betrayed by Judas. 
will soon be arrested by the temple police as the events that will lead to his death on a cross are now fully in motion. And notice, if you will, friends, in between communion and capture, we find Jesus in conversation with the Father. Between supper and being seized, we find the Savior engaged in supplication. And notice, if you will, the content of his, con of his conversation and the scope of his supplication. Jesus says to the Father, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Now, the cup here refers figurative, figuratively to that which is allotted to a person. And for Jesus, that allotment was the cross. So in other words, what Jesus is saying is, Daddy, is there any other way we can do this? Is there any way I can get out of going to the cross? Now, what you've got to understand, friends, is the cross is his destiny. And it's not that Jesus didn't want his destiny. He didn't want the discomfort that came along with it. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, hey, daddy, there's some stuff in this cup that I don't want to drink. Is there any other way we can make this happen for humanity without me having to hurt so badly? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been aware of your destiny but afraid of the discomfort that comes along with it? Here's what I don't want you to miss today, friends. Jesus is teaching us a valuable lesson, and here it is. Jesus is teaching us that destiny does not come without discomfort. And at some point, you've got to cope with your cup because what you're called to is bigger than you anyway. Because if Jesus does not cope with his cup, if he does not push past this discomfort, then we all die without deliverance. And I don't know who I came to preach to today, but I came to tell you that if you cannot accept discomfort, you will never be able to achieve destiny. Which means what? Which means some people will never achieve destiny because they whine too much. Some people will never achieve destiny because they complain too much. Some people will never achieve destiny because they crave comfort too much. But I came to tell you, friends, uh, that just because your cross is uncomfortable does not mean you don't still have to carry it. Are you listening to what I just said? I said just because your cross is uncomfortable doesn't mean you don't have to still carry it. And God sent me to this church to tell somebody, I know it's heavy, but you been called to carry it. I know it's painful, but you've been called to carry it. I know it comes with discomfort, but you've been called to carry it. I know it's intimidating, but you've been called to carry it. You've got to cope with your cup because you've been called to carry this thing. Will you give your neighbor a big high five and tell him you're called to carry this one? It's here. It's a thesis for my little sermon today. Write this down if you're taking notes. You cannot have destiny if you cannot accept the fact that there will be discomfort and still make the decision to surrender to God in spite of the discomfort. Did you hear what I said? That's, that's the sermon today. That you will never achieve destiny if you cannot accept the fact that there will be discomfort and still make the decision to surrender to God in spite of the discomfort. And I'm, I'm looking for some folk in this church today who can say, Pastor, that's where I've made it to in this place in my life. I'm going to surrender to God, not because there is no discomfort, but I'm going to surrender to God in spite of the discomfort. Why? Because there's no way you can give God a conditional yes. And is there anybody in this church other than me today who can testify, I'm giving God an unconditional yes in my life. In spite of the discomfort, I want my destiny. Friends, as we're in this series, can I tell you why I'm preaching this? Because as we've been in this series of moving forward, God has taught us how to embrace necessary endings. God has taught us how to release the past. Just last week, God taught us how we can understand and overcome trauma. But today, God is trying to teach us how to accept his will. 
And ultimately, at some point in your life, uh, you're going to have to learn how to accept what God allows. At some point in your life, you've got to understand that there are times I don't want the cup. But if this is the cup that God has presented to me, then i got to drink what's in the cup. Because it ain't about what I want. It's about what God wants. And I'm looking for somebody in this church today who can say, that's where I'm at in this season of my life. I want to accept the will of God, that the will of God might not be what I want, but if it's God's will, it's what's best for me. So, so here's the take home truth, and I'm almost done. Here's the take home truth, and I'm almost done. In order to accomplish your purpose, you have to desire to please God more than you want to avoid pain. Did you hear what I just said? That's the sermon in the sentence. In order for you to accomplish your purpose, if you're going to be like Jesus, you got a desire to please God more than you want to avoid pain. And that's all I came to tell somebody is that if you're going to be all that God has called you to be, you're going to have to be like the Navy SEALs. You got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You're going to have to learn how to cope with your cup because your desire to please God is greater than your desire to avoid pain. So, so how do I do it? I hear what you're saying. You say, okay, brother. That's cute, but how do I do it? How do I cope with my cup? Anybody interested? There, there, there are four things I see in this text today. Don't worry, I see your face. You said his sermon is long enough with three things, and I ain't talking about four. There are four things <laughs> I see in this text today. Can I share them with you to help you cope with your cup? H here it is. If you're going to cope with your cup, the first thing the text is going to teach is right there in verse 39 through 41. The first thing you're going to have to do is, first of all, you got to understand that your disciplines must be maintained. Everybody say your disciplines must be maintained. I'm, I'm moving as quickly as I can. Notice, friends, the text opens up with Jesus in a familiar posture that we've seen him in throughout the Gospel of Luke. He's in prayer. Luke's gospel, throughout his entire gospel, Luke portrays Jesus as a man of prayer. And in this text, he does no differently. The text says that Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives which was his custom and he steps away from the disciples and he begins to pray. I love it because even in the midst of discomfort Jesus maintains the spiritual discipline of prayer. Why? Because Jesus is teaching us three things about prayer. Anybody interested? Here's the first one. Jesus is teaching us that prayer is personal. Let church out personal. Now, now there's something I don't want you to miss today Deacon Bubba because it's too good for you to miss it. Watch text. Jesus brings the disciples to the garden with him, but he don't take them to God with him. You missed it. Uh, I said he takes the disciples to the garden with him, but he don't take them to God with him. No, Teresa, when Jesus prays, he does so alone. Now, friends, I like that because there are times for intercession and there are times for touching and agreeing, but there are other times, friends, when we got to learn how to pray for ourselves because prayer is a personal practice and at some point, it's got to just be you and God. And friends, this is a good word for us today because here's the truth of the day and hold on to it. If you never break away in prayer, you will eventually break down under the pressure. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm looking for somebody in this place who can say every day of my life, I'm taking some personal time to talk to my God because life is too hard. The burdens are too heavy for me to be able to handle it on my own. And if my mama won't pray, if my daddy won't pray, if my co-workers won't pray, if the folk in my church won't pray, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to get down on my knees because this is personal. Yes, sir. But it gets gooder. Yes, sir. He teaches prayer is personal. It's a Sweeney. He don't just teach us personal. Watch it. He teaches prayer must be persistent. Can, can, can I show you that? Look, look what the text says. It's there in verse 39. He went to the Mount of Olives. Here it is. The text says as was his custom. Hmm. That word custom there in its original Greek etymology is literally the word ethos, which translates to mean his practice. Hmm. I love the way Eugene Peterson said it in the Message Bible. Eugene Peterson says, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, here it is, as he so often did. Don't miss it. 
Jesus is doing in discomfort what he was doing before discomfort. Tracy, oh, they're not helping me preach. Don't miss it. Jesus always prayed before it was time to go to the cross. And he doesn't stop praying when it's time to face the cross. Why? Because God is trying to teach us a word today. Here it is. What's the word? Don't let your cross change your character. And don't let your discomfort disrupt your devotion. Y'all not trying to help me preach. I said don't let your cross change your character. And don't allow your discomfort to disrupt your devotion. When trouble comes, you better keep on praying. You better keep on talking to God. You better keep on staying in the face of God. You better stay on your knees. Because the only way to make it through trouble is to keep doing what you were doing before trouble. And I'm looking for some folk in this church today who can say, Reverend, that's my prayer. Prayer is my practice. I'm persistent in prayer. I pray when I'm up. I pray when I'm down. I pray when I'm happy. I pray when I'm sad. I pray in plenty. I pray in scarcity. Because I don't just talk to God before the storms of life are raging. I keep talking to God when the storms of life are raging. Because the only reason I made it this far it's because I learned how to get down on my knees and say, Father, I stray my hand unto thee. No other help I know. Is there anybody in this church who can say, no matter what I go through, I'm going to keep on praying? I'm, I'm, all right. All right. They don't like this sermon. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. There's one more thing Jesus teaches. Prayer must be personal. Prayer must be persistent. But you ready for it? Prayer must not be played with. Uh, prayer, prayer, prayer must, if I say, don't, don't play with prayer. No. Notice Jesus' prayer, Deacon Williams, I'm, I'm trying to preach this Bible. Notice what he said. Father, if you will. Mm. Von Daniels, that's my cousin. Watch, watch what it says. Move this cup for me. But if not, let your will be done. Don't miss this, friends, because this, this is one of the greatest parts of the whole summer. Don't miss this. Jesus is not praying to change the Father's will. He's praying so the Father can change his will. See, Jesus is not trying to use prayer as some kind of spiritual slot machine or some kind of tool of manipulating and moving the hand of God into action. Mm -mm. Jesus knows you can't play with prayer like that. No. Jesus is not, God is not your spiritual sugar daddy. God is not your cosmic bellhop. Prayer is not a slot machine that if you pull on it long enough, you're going to hit the divine jackpot. That's not what prayer is. See, friends, we don't pray so God can give us what we want. We pray so God will make us comfortable with what he wants. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You ain't feeling um, C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, I pray because I can't help myself. He said, prayer doesn't change God. It changes me. Okay. Okay. You don't like C.S. Lewis. Let me give it to you the way my 10-year-old said it to me the other day. Uh, a day... Uh, I'm riding to the church, my, my, my little shadow, she in the car with me. And uh, that day I had on my old school gospel playlist. I got a playlist for everything. Uh, I, I put on my old school gospel playlist. And, and, and would you know, Marcus Hunt, would you know uh, that that old song came on the radio, Lord, do it. You know that, Lord, do it. Do it for me right now. And I'm listening to the song. And all of a sudden, Maurice Patterson, my little 10-year-old daughter, looked up and said, Daddy, this song ain't right. I, I looked at her and I said, see, baby, this old school, you don't understand. Stick to Kirk Franklin. Uh, I, I, I said, this is this, this, this too old for you, baby. You, you, you don't understand. She looked at me and literally with, with sincerity in her eyes, my daughter looked at me. She said, no, daddy, God doesn't act on our command. God does what he wants when he wants to. 
when she said that to me, the Holy Ghost showed up and said, if a 10-year-old can get that, why can't you? Why? Because when we pray, God has no obligation to give you what you want. We don't pray so God will change his will. We pray so God will make us comfortable with his will. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing. And everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your request known unto God. Now that's the push for prayer in verse number 6. But here comes the promise for prayer in verse number 7. The promise of prayer is not the answer you want. The promise for prayer ain't that you're going to get a house. The promise for prayer ain't that you're going to get a car. The promise of prayer ain't that you're going to get a job. The promise of prayer ain't that you're going to get money. The promise of prayer is and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I came to tell you, prayer might not change it, but it certainly will change you. That we don't pray so we can get what we want. We pray so that God will give us the peace to accept what he wants. And I'm looking for somebody in this church who can say, that's why I'm going to keep on praying. Not so I can change the will of God, but so God can change my will and make me comfortable with what he wants. All right. Number two. Y'all, I'm trying. They're not helping me. Um, you're going to cope with your cup. Your disciplines must be maintained. Hmm. So, Snickleberry, there's something else I see in this text. If you're going to cope with your cup, the second thing you got to do is you got to accept that there will be discomfort in your mission. Everybody say, accept. There'll be discomfort in your mission. Hmm. I'm there verse 42 and 44 now. Now, we've seen that Jesus prayed. But notice what and how he prayed. Can, can I preach it in this place? It's there in verse 42 and 44. The text says in verse 42, that Jesus prays, Father, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. Hmm. Lexus, the New Living Translation helps us to understand more fully what the request. Because the New Living Translation says, that Jesus prays, please take away this cup of suffering from me. Gerald Kareem, the Passion Translation says, that Jesus prays, Father, if you're willing, take this cup of agony away from me. Verse 44 says he's praying in such great agony that his sweat is like drops of blood falling to the ground. In other words, Jesus is saying, Daddy, please don't make me do it. Jesus is saying, Daddy, don't make me go through this. Daddy, is there any way I can skip this part? Have you ever been there? Have you ever known that pain was up ahead? He said, God, don't make me go through this. That's, that's what Jesus is. And I love it because Jesus is teaching us two things here. You ready for it? Jesus is teaching us, first of all, we ought to expect pain. Everybody say, we got to expect our pain. Don't, don't, don't miss this today, friends. I'm trying to preach as, as well as I can. Don't miss this. Jesus is not in denial about what lies ahead. He expects the pain. Hmm. See, he knows that death on a cross will be anything other than humane. It's going to include the most excruciating pain possible. And ultimately, it's going to end with him dying. Jesus says, I expect this will be painful. And I ain't trying to do this. Friends, this is a good word for us in the 21st century church. Because I believe in the 21st century church. We expect everything but pain. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We got great expectations for God to bless us, prosper us, expand us, grow us, expose us, elevate us, position us, and take care of us. And we bought into some kind of notion that a God who loves us will never cause us to suffer. 
But C.S. Lewis says that it is because God loves us that he gives us the gift of suffering. Job said in Job 2 and 10, his wife said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Job says to his wife, should I just expect good things from God and never anything bad? In other words, we can not only expect for life to be prosperous, we also got to expect some pain. Some things will not work out. Some people will disappoint us. Some loved ones will die. Injustice will exist. Oppression will be present. Evil will come in all kinds of forms. And I know what you're saying. Why do those kind of things happen? Because life has pain. Job said, man, born of a woman. Is of a few days. And them few days, they full of trouble. David said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Peter said, think it not strange when you go through the fiery trials. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Now, if Job said it, if David said it, if Peter said it, and if Jesus said it, then why every time pain comes, you start acting brand new? Child, please, uh, we can expect some pain. If Jesus had to go through a cross, what makes you think you're going to get out of life without a crisis? I've said it this way before, and it bears repeating. If Jesus got a hole in his hand, what makes you think you're going to get to heaven with a manicure on yours? We're going through something. But can I give you the shout? Can I give you a shout? John Turner, they don't want to shout with me. Can you shout with me? Here's the shout. Notice that not only can we expect pain, but we can also expect God's presence. Because notice that while expecting pain, Jesus is still talking to the Father. Meaning he knows he's about to go through something. But he also knows he ain't going through by himself. And I'm looking for somebody in this church who can say, that's why I can go to bed tonight. That's why I'm not losing my mind. That's why I ain't walking around with a straight jacket on. That's why I still got a smile on my face because I know life is going to be painful but I also know God is going to be present and I don't need all of y'all in here. I just need the real folk who done lived through some painful seasons and you know it's not till you get in the middle of the valley that you learn he's the lily in the valley but you done been through some dark enough days to know he walks with me he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. I dare you to give your neighbor a big high five and say pain is present but God is too he will be with you. All right. All right. You're going to accept discomfort on the mission. God knows you got to expect pain. Hmm. Diggy Smith, I'm trying. Here, here it is. Hold on. It gets gooder. But he also teaches us we got to express our pain. Everybody say express it. Uh, Reverend Allen, one more thing I got to say here. I won't stay here too long, huh, but we can't miss it. Uh, don't miss this. from Corey Hamilton. Jesus is asking the Father, don't miss this, AP, to help him to avoid pain he always knew he was going to have to face. Um, it's not like the cross was a surprise. It's not like God just came with the cross like a pop quiz. You know, go heal some folk. Go feed some folk. Ooh, all of a sudden, time to die. That ain't how it happened. He was born to die. He came to die. He left heaven knowing I got to die. Meaning, Jesus, as the, old, as the young folk would say, he understood the assignment. Uh, he knew the assignment. But don't miss this. He didn't just know the assignment. He knew how it was going to end. See, Valerie Tony, 
He didn't just know he was going to die. He also knew he was going to get back up. He knew the assignment and he knew the end. He knew exactly how the story was going to end. So here's the revelation. Can I get the revelation though? Yes, sir. But just because Jesus knew the end don't mean he liked the middle. Yeah. And Jesus is teaching us, friends, that Faith doesn't exempt you from having feelings. See, just because I know God is going to work it out doesn't mean I always like the way he's working it out. Just because I know how it's going to end don't mean I always like the middle. But what Jesus shows us in this text is we can express our fears to God. We can express our feelings to God. We can express our frustrations to God. Why? Because if we can't be honest with him, we can't be held helped by him. And I don't know who I'm preaching to in this church, but I came to tell somebody, it's time for you to be real with God. Because as soon as you hand your issues to him, he can start to intervene on your behalf. You're going to cope with your cup, your discipline's got to be maintained. If you're going to cope with your cup, not only must your discipline be maintained, got to accept there's going to be some discomfort in your mission. But can I give you a third one? I'm almost done, y'all. Here it is. You must know there's a decision you have to make. Everybody say, there's a decision you have to make. <laughs> now, now, can I tell you what makes me shout? Um, I, I don't know about you, but what makes me shout is that this entire narrative, this entire text of Reverend Dr. George Bell, it all hangs on 12 letters. Uh, the whole text, the whole text hangs on 12 letters. Now, depending on your translation of the Bible, it might be one word with 12 letters, or it may be four words with 12 letters. But the whole text hinges on 12 letters in verse 42. You ready for them? Jesus says, Father, if it's your will, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Here it is. Here come the 12 letters. Nevertheless, you missed it. Okay. Just in case you didn't like them 12 letters, maybe you got a newer translation of the Bible. And in a newer translation of the Bible, you'll see these 12 letters like this. Not my will. Okay. What's funny is that in the Message Bible, it's still 12 letters. In the Message Bible, it says, not what I want. <laughs> Don't miss it. Well, it's nevertheless, yet not my will. Not what I want. The point is clear. Jesus makes a decision. But you ain't ready for the real shout. You ready for the real shout? Hear the real shout. Jesus makes a decision before God even gives him an answer. He ain't said amen yet. He don't know if his daddy going to answer in the affirmative and take away the cup yet. But before he gets an answer, he already gives an answer. While he's praying, he's already made up his mind. And what Jesus is saying is, Father, I would really like to not have to go to the cross. I would really not like to have to do this. But if you still make me go, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Y'all... Jesus is teaching us three things I got to give you. Here, here it is. You ready for it? Yes, when Jesus says this, what he's saying is, I'll embrace the path. Yes. Jesus is saying, if you want me to go to the cross, I'll go to the cross. Yes. Jesus says, I'll embrace this path. If this is the road you want me to travel, yeah. then nevertheless, this is the road I'm on. But Jesus is not just saying, I'll embrace the path. Jesus is saying, I'll endure the path. Yes. When Jesus says, nevertheless, what he's saying is, I'll let them put nails in my hand. When Jesus says, nevertheless, what he's saying is, I'll let him put nails in my feet. When Jesus says, nevertheless, he's saying, I'll let him put a crown of thorns on my head. When Jesus says, nevertheless, he's saying, I'll let them put a spear through my side. Jesus is saying, Daddy, if you want me to go through this kind of pain, I'll endure the pain. But can I give you the shout? Here's the shout. Jesus says the reason that I'll embrace the path and the reason I'll endure the pain is because I'm eager to please my daddy. Don't miss it. He says, nevertheless, not my will, yeah. but 
Thy will be done. Now, when you go study this text in the Greek, when you look at these phrases in the Greek etymology, you'll discover something that's interesting. When Jesus says, my will, here, it means an inclination or an attitude to favor one alternative over the other. But when Jesus says, your will, in the Greek, it means to happen or to come to pass. When you put them together, what Jesus is really saying is, now my flesh has an alternative that it would prefer. <laughs> but I know that ultimately whatever you want is going to happen anyway. So I surrender to what you want and not what I want. And friends, if we're going to accomplish the destiny that God has sent us to this earth to accomplish, we got to have a nevertheless in our spirit. We got to have a nevertheless that says, God, I'll embrace the paths you have me on even when I don't understand stand them. And God, I'll endure the pain you let me go through, even when I don't feel I deserve it. Why? Because I'm eager to please you. Jesus says, I just want to make God happy. And I'm looking for some folk in this church today who can say, that's my testimony. I just want to make God happy. I got a nevertheless in my spirit. Not because I don't want to go through hurt, but because I want to make God happy. And my yes to God is a yes to the question that ain't even been asked yet. And I'm looking for somebody in this church who can and say, God, whatever it takes uh, to make you happy, sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. If I got to go on a path I don't want, I'll take it. If I got to endure pain I don't want, I'll take it. Because I want to make you happy. So for your glory, I will do anything uh, just to see you, uh, to behold you as my king. Uh, so here's my testimony. I'll say yes, uh, Lord, yes, uh, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. And when your spirit hey, speaks to me with my whole heart, I will agree. And my answer yes, will be yes. Lord. Lord, yes. All right, I'm getting out of here. I'm getting out of here. I got to sign off for the day. This sermon done went too long already. You're going to cope with your cup. Your discipline's got to be maintained. I, I think I want to unload in here. I don't know if y'all going to take the bricks off me. Here it is. It says I gotta, discipline's got to be maintained. It says that you got to accept discomfort on the mission. There's a decision you got to make. But here's the shot of the day. When you do all of those things, you, can, you know that you will receive divine motivation to keep going. Everybody say divine motivation to keep going. All right. I'm signing off, but here's why I like Luke's version of this narrative better than Matthew and Mark's. Because Luke says something in verse 43 that Matthew and Mark don't say in their gospel accounts. Verse 43 says, that while Jesus praying, here it is, an angel showed up. The angel appeared and gave him strength. Now, some translations say the angel came and strengthen him. Now, now, I love it because angels are prominent in the Gospel of Luke. Matter of fact, we see them from the very first chapter throughout the end of the Gospel. But here's what's different. Normally, whenever we see an angel in the book of Luke, they come with a message. <laughs> but this angel don't come with a message. He comes on a mission. Y'all don't want to have church. And what's the mission? To give Jesus strength. Now, 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 you can't appreciate that if you ain't studied this text in the Greek. Because that word strengthen, I feel like doing that too. That word strengthen in the text. In the Greek, y'all, it literally means to re-strengthen. It means to pour strength back into. Oh, that shouts me. Because for the angel to need to re-strengthen or to pour back strength into means that somewhere along the way, Jesus lost some strength. And friends, if Jesus can lose strength, but make you think you're going to be strong all the time. If Jesus could need strength, pour it back into him. What make you think you're going to be strong every day of the year and every day of your life? Yes. She teaches me. Sometimes I might lose some strength, but I serve a God.
who knows how to send me an angel to make sure I get my strength back. I love what Dr. George Morrison said regarding this text. Dr. George Morrison said, every life has its Gethsemane, but every Gethsemane has its angel. Y'all don't want to have no church. In other words, you and I might lose our strength. But God will make sure we always get our strength back. The angel came and strengthened him. Strengthened him for what you asked. I'm glad you asked. The angel strengthened him for the road ahead. See, the angel knew there was betrayal on the other side of this prayer. There were beatings on the other side of this prayer. There was a cross to bear on the other side of this prayer. There was a bleeding body on the other side of this prayer. There was a borrowed tomb on the other side of this prayer. There was a dark Friday on the other side of this prayer. Yeah. Which means God sent him an angel yeah. to give him the strength to get through Friday. And friends, that teaches me that it's not that God won't put more on me than I can bear. It's just he'll always make sure I got the strength to bear Here's the shout I've been trying to get to all day long. You ready for the line? I've been trying to get to all day long. Because here's the shout. God sends an angel to strengthen him. Why? Because God says if you will cope with your cup, he'll give you what you need to consume the contents. Y'all ain't trying to have no church. I, I said if you can cope with your cup, he'll give you what you need to endure the contents. But can I give you the real shout? Here's the real shout. The angel didn't just come to make sure he would get through Friday. And the angel showed up to make sure Jesus was going to get to Sunday. Because there was not just crucifixion in that cup, no. But there was also, there was also resurrection in that cup. And, uh, oh Lord, and uh, I, I, I don't know who I'm preaching to. Lord, uh, but is there anybody in the room today hmm, who knows you're not just going to get uh, through Friday? Hmm. Lord, uh, oh Lord, but you are going to get to Sunday. Hmm. Have I got myself a win in, the, in this church? Why don't you just lean over and tell somebody real fast? Uh, tell them, hey neighbor, you're going to get through Friday. Lord, and you're going to get to Sunday. Hmm. I know that it's hard and I know that it's rough. Hmm. And, and I know the going has been mighty tough. Hmm. But I'll stop by to tell somebody you're going to get through Friday and you're going to get to Sunday, hmm. and because you serve a God who says you're going to get through sickness and going to get to healing. Hmm. You're going to get through poverty and get to plenty. Hmm. You're going to get through your hard days and you're going to make it into a brand new season. Now, now if you know the day you're going to get through Friday and you're going to get to Sunday, hmm. then I I need you to help me to help somebody in the room. Why don't you lean over and find you a neighbor real quick. Put on your preacher voice. Act Baptist this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor. Y'all don't want to have no church. Now, I need you to find somebody that look like God been good. I need you to find somebody that look like they've been through a bad Friday. But they're on their way to a brand new Sunday. So just lean over and tell your neighbor, put on your preacher voice and say, hey, neighbor. Hey. Uh, we are almost there. Now, I need you to find somebody that look like they came to church to have church. Uh, I need you to find somebody that look like they on their way to Sunday morning. Uh, I need you to find somebody in hand, uh, that look like God been good to them. Uh, put on your preacher voice uh, and say, hey, 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 neighbor. Uh, tell them, hey, neighbor, uh, you're going to get through Friday. Uh, 
and you're gonna get to Sunday. Cause God, he ain't forgot about you. God, he gonna send you an angel. God, he gonna bring you through. Is there anybody here that knows we serve a God who'll get you through? He'll get you to. Is there anybody here who can testify that I've gone through the fire and I've been through the flood? I've been broken in the pieces, ceiling and flesh from, from above. But I remember that he loved me and he cares and he'll never, no, 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 no. He'll never put more on me than I can bear. Is there anybody here that can testify that when life gets hard, he'll send an angel. When life gets rough, he'll send an angel. When the going gets tough, he'll send an angel. Now, I don't need all of y'all here. I just need the real folk who can testify. When I was down, he lifted me. When I was sick, he healed me. When I was broke, he paid my bills. When I didn't know how I was going to make it, he brought me out and he made a way. He opened the door and he saw me through. And this Sunday morning, I got a shout because he gave me strength. After the divorce, he gave me strength. After the death, he gave me strength. After the layoff, he gave me strength. After the fourth closure, huh? he gave me strength. Huh? After the repossession, huh? he gave me strength. Huh? Is there anybody here huh? who can testify? Huh? I'm only here because huh? he gave me strength. Huh? Is there anybody here huh? that can testify? Huh? The only reason huh? I'm still here huh? is because I said to God huh? who give you strength huh? when you can't make it huh? on your own. Huh? Well, if you believe it, huh? why don't you grab huh? Uh, na, 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 na. Uh, na, 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 na. Why don't you grab somebody? Huh? Y'all ain't grabbing nobody. Huh? Grab your neighbor. Huh? Grab your neighbor. Hey. Y'all ain't helping me preach. Huh? I said, grab your neighbor's hand huh? and tell him, neighbor, huh? tell him, I don't know huh? what you're going through. Huh? I don't know huh? what you're dealing with. Huh? Tell him, I don't know huh? how hard it is. Huh? But tell him, neighbor, huh? the Holy Ghost huh? is going to give you strength. Huh? He's going to give you strength huh? to make it through the sickness. Huh? He's going to give you strength huh? to make it through the storm. Huh? He's going to give you strength huh? to make it through the rain. Huh? He gonna give you strength huh? to make it through huh? what you're going through. Huh? And if you believe it, huh? why don't you get up huh? out of your seat? Huh? Why don't you move huh? on your feet? Huh? And if you believe it, huh? why don't you praise him? Huh? Lift your hands, huh? throw your head back huh? and say, Lord, Give me strength, cause if you give me strength, I can make it. If you give me strength, I can go on. If you give me strength, everything is gonna be all right. So grab your neighbor. Yeah, 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 yeah. I said grab your neighbor one more time. Y'all ain't grabbing nobody. Grab somebody by their hand. Rock them and shake them. Shake them and rock them, rock them and shake them, shake them and rock them. Y'all ain't rocking, and y'all ain't shaking. Find somebody on your row, rock them and shake them, shake them and rock them, rock them and shake them, shake them and rock them, rock them and shake them, shake them and rock them. And tell a neighbor, ask them, do you feel like I feel? They not having church. Say neighbor. Ask them, do you feel like I feel? Ask them, how do you feel? Tell them, I got a feeling. Do you feel it? I said, I got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. Because weeping me into for the night. The shot. Is coming in the morning. Is 
he all right? I said, is he all right? Won't he make a way? Won't he open doors? Won't he see you through? Won't he provide? Is there anybody here who can give God a praise? Because you're still here by the grace of God. Well, I'm done here. I find one more neighbor. I tell him, neighbor, help me praise him. Tell him, neighbor, help me give him glory. Because if he going to give you strength, you ought to give him a shout. You ought to want to have no church. I said, if he going to give you strength, you ought to give him a shout. So let everything, I said, let everything, let everything that's got breath, give him some praise. Praise him like he's keeping you. Praise him like he's holding you. Praise him like he's sustaining you. Yeah, yeah. Praise him like can't nobody do you like Jesus. I said, can't nobody do you like the Lord. Well, I'm done here. But is there anybody here that can say, since he strengthened me, I got to shout for him. Since he strengthened me, I got to praise him. I got to bless him. But when I count to three, let everything that's been strengthened, let everything that's got your strength back, that's got your joy back. That's got your peace back. That's got your love back. Give him a praise like he's the God who strengthens. One, two, three, shout. 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 Yeah. Shout like you got strength. Shout like you got joy. Shout like he's strengthening you. When I count to three, give God the best shout you got. One, two, three. Yeah, 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 yeah. Given your strength, say it's already done. Say it's already done. Say it's already done. Say it's already done. Because God's gonna do it. I say God's gonna do it. I say God's gonna do. I say God's gonna do it. Hey, say this one. Not much longer now. Things are about to shift quickly. Not much longer now. Things are about to shift quickly. Say it. Not much longer now. Oh, oh, oh. things are about. Hey, not much longer now. Things are about to shift quickly. Hey, not much longer now. Hold on, listen. Hold on. This is what I'm saying. Not much longer now. Things are about to shift quickly. Now listen, do me a favor. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, tell him I need God to shift some stuff. Tell him and I don't need him to take a long time. I need him to do it quickly. Anybody need him to do it quickly? If you need him to do it quickly, we're going to declare and praise God together. Y'all ready? Let's do it together. Everybody say, huh? not much longer now. Things are about to shift quickly. Hey, huh? not much longer now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Not much longer. Not much longer now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Not much longer now. Not much longer now. Things are about to shift. Things are about to shift quickly. Things are about to shift quickly. Things are about to shift quickly. Hey. Things are about to shift quickly. Things are about to shift quickly. 
We are about to shift quickly. Stand into your feet, we gotta go. Stand into your feet, we gotta go. Stand into your feet. Stand into your feet, we gotta go. I'm blessed to be alive. Stand into your feet. Lift those hands. How many of you know you're blessed to be alive today? How many folk today can testify if it wouldn't been for the Lord, you wouldn't still be here? Praise team. Y'all grab a couple mics. I'm, I don't know if you know this one. We're going to learn it real quickly. Come on. Oh, you already know it. Praise Come on. Come if you on. would like to worship in giving, you have four options. Online by clicking give at the top of our website's homepage, mtoimbc.org, by sending a text to the Olive at 73256. Scanning the QR code displayed throughout the building or in person using the envelopes in the back of your pew. Then place them in secure receptacles near each entrance.